I'm looking at a photo of an old-fashioned operating theater. And theater is the appropriate word because, as a patient lay on the table surrounded by doctors and nurses and medical equipment, tiers of amphitheater-style seating surrounded the scene, filled with medical students watching and learning. It's about the year 1850. No one's wearing masks or gloves. There's no sterilization of environment or equipment. Wide acceptance of the so-called germ theory of disease was still a few years away, so a surgical room packed with onlookers was perfectly normal at the time. And if that sounds antiquated, wait till you hear about the lighting. Operating rooms in those days were built facing the southeast with windows in the ceilings to make use of sunlight. Edison's light bulbs were still 30-odd years into the future. Operations could only happen at certain times of day and only if it wasn't cloudy. Not only that, but it was all too easy for the surgeons to block their own light while they were working. Let's pause for a moment and be grateful that we all live in the year 2020. There were some attempts to use mirrors to reflect light, but it was unreliable and besides it created a lot of heat. Some rooms were lit by gas lamps, which again caused a lot of heat and made the air dirty. And even when light bulbs came on the market, those early ones weren't powerful enough to meet the needs of an operating room. So, the next thing you know, we had snow globes. Well, I've left out a few details, but yes, those are indeed points A and B of our story. And in between, there are shoemakers, World War II, Austrian souvenir shops, baby food, and a super top-secret process for creating fake snow. One that literally only one person on Earth knows. And luckily, I know where to find him. Yeah, so my name is Erin Piazzi. And I'm Brian Earle. This is Christmas Past. The snow globe is one of those items that seems like it could have been around forever. No wind-up clockwork, no batteries, just a simple scene like a house or a well-known building encased in a water-filled globe and mounted on a pedestal. You shake it up and glittering snow whirls around the scene as it slowly falls. But they are a relatively new invention, and it wasn't until decades after their invention that they'd become more or less exclusively a Christmas decoration. To start our story, we need to go to Vienna, Austria, and meet a man named Erwin Percy. Yeah, so my name is Erwin Percy. Exactly Erwin Percy III. No, not that Erwin Percy. His grandfather, Erwin I. So my, my grandfather, his business was surgical instrument, and his customers, the surgeons, asked my grandfather to improve Edison's light bulb. And Edison's electric light bulb would be the perfect light, but it was not bright enough. So his first idea was to augment Edison's light bulb by putting a glass lens in front of it. The problem was, A, the glass lens was too big and expensive to make it a viable product, and B, it didn't work that great anyway. So he kept looking around for inspiration. And so my grandfather saw uh, at a shoemaker's workbench a glass globe filled with water, and behind this glass globe, the shoemaker uh, burned a candle. And the light of the candle has been uh, magnified by this water-filled glass globe. And my grandfather grabbed this idea, and he used a water-filled glass globe instead of the solid glass lens. And he received just a small light Bought, and my grandfather was uh, not very happy with this. But he thought he might be on to something. Maybe there was something he could do with the water to amplify the light. So he got the idea of crushing up glass into a fine glitter, creating thousands and thousands of tiny reflectors. But the glass was much heavier than the water and it sank to the bottom quickly. One day, inspiration struck in the unlikeliest of places, the cupboard. Uh, he found uh, a white powder in the kitchen of his mother, semolina, beet semolina used for baby food. He poured this powder into this water-filled glass globe. And when he looked in the globe, it looks like snowfall because these little flakes floated very slowly to the ground like snowfall. The semolina did stay afloat a little better, but it still wasn't quite the perfect solution. The perfect solution for lighting an operating room anyway, but it was perfect for a friend of Percy's. A friend of my grandfather. Uh, he operated a little souvenir shop next to a church here in Austria. It's a favorite pilgrim 
site, and uh, this friend sold candles and Christmas crosses and all these things, and he asked my grandfather to make a little miniature of the basilica. And my grandfather had this little church on his workbench, and he mounted the church in the water-filled glass globe filled with uh, semolina, and uh, he gave this glass globe to his friend, and he sold it right away. And that's the story about how in 1900, in Vienna, Austria, a surgical device maker unintentionally created that iconic symbol of Christmas recognized all the world over. Or at least it's the beginning of the story. Kersey never did find his perfect solution for surgical rooms, so he eventually abandoned the project. But seeing the potential of this new thing he created, he spent the next five years working up a system for mass producing the items for sale in souvenir shops. To get to where we are now, we're going to have to move one generation and one Erwin Percy forward in time. So now we're in the years just after World War II. The country is occupied by foreign troops, and Erwin Percy Jr. worked part-time at the Vienna Courier, a newspaper run by American troops. And my, my father was working for these people, and, and they saw the snow globes. And they said this would be a wonderful product for the United States if there would be no church inside. My father's idea was changing the pilgrim souvenir to a Christmas item. And my my father made a Christmas tree, a Santa Claus, and a snowman. It wasn't until about 1950, when the snow globe came to America and got a secular overhaul, that it became a Christmas tradition. And while many companies manufacture them nowadays, the Percy Family Factory has been in continuous operation ever since those early days. The 55 employees make about 200,000 globes every year in 350 designs, including some that Aaron Percy Jr. created decades ago. Which brings us to the present day, with Aaron Percy III running the show, but I caught up with him just in time. So I represent the third generation working on snow globes, and my daughter, she is the fourth generation, and she will be taken over in a couple months because my idea is asking for retirement in the next month, but uh, I I will retire on paper, you know, because making snow globes, this is my life, and uh, I love my job. But before he retires, on paper or otherwise, he'll have to pass on a family secret. That process for making the snow is closely guarded. Aaron Jr. wouldn't share the secret with Aaron III until he earned his master's degree. And I play the same thing with my daughter now. It's a a very special process to create the snow. And there are some tricks you need to use. This is my personal secret. And uh, the day when she is taken over, uh, then I will tell her. Aaron III is the only person in the world who currently knows this secret. And at least for now, He's going to keep it that way. I have a special machine for the production of the snow. And uh, this machine is not in my factory. It's in my private house. Now it's time for a Christmas memory. And if you've been following the season so far, you know that the Christmas memories will work a little different this year. That's because I'm recording most of these episodes in the summer when it's just a little too early for me to ask you for them. And I'm doing that because come November, we'll be welcoming a new member to the Christmas Past family and to the household here at Christmas Past Headquarters. So, in many of these episodes, the Christmas memories you'll hear will be from yours truly. But I want you to hear me loud and clear, I still want to include your Christmas memories this season, and there's still time to send them and there's still a place for them in the episodes that will arrive closer to Christmas Day. So, as always, the thing to do is record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Just keep it reasonably short, clean and family-friendly, and as always, be sure to say your name and where you're from. Now, Christmas caroling is, of course, a time-honored tradition. Most of us who celebrate Christmas have at least one memory of singing carols in a group setting, or maybe experiencing a group of carolers singing a four-part harmony and dressed in Victorian garb. I vaguely recall my Cub Scout troop singing at a local nursing home in Massachusetts. And another time going door to door with the kids on the cul-de-sac where I grew up, spreading Christmas cheer in our neighborhood. But one of my most vivid memories of caroling is from sometime in the early 2000s. I was living in the Jamaica Plain neighborhood of Boston, and these were the early days of the flash mob craze. Remember those? 
a local a cappella group was organizing a caroling mob, and my wife and I decided to go. Our first stop was a nearby grocery store. There were maybe 20 of us, and shortly after we arrived at the store, the leader played a reference tone on his pitch pipe, and we all broke into a rendition of Angels We Have Heard on High as we walked up and down the store aisles. We got several looks of shocked delight from the shoppers. And then it was on to some of the surrounding neighborhoods where the caroling was less of a flash mob and more of that traditional door-to-door thing. We came to one apartment complex where one man opened his door to us, and when he understood that we were singing Christmas carols, he yelled, Everybody out! And within seconds, every door in the complex opened and everyone came outside onto their stoops. Apparently, it was a tight-knit complex and this guy knew everyone. After we had finished, the man thanked us, and I don't remember quite what he said, but I remember getting the sense that having a group of carolers visit his home and sing for him had been a very special experience. And that's one of the great powers of Christmas caroling. Maybe more than enjoying familiar songs, it's about the simple notion of using the human voice and social callings to create surprise, delight, and a heartwarming embodiment of the Christmas spirit. Christmas Past is produced in wonderful Willow Glen, California by yours truly, Brian Earl. Thanks to Aaron Percy III, and as always, thank you for listening. You can find out more about the original Viennese Snow Globe Manufacture Company by going to viennasnowglobe.at. I'll put a link to that in the show notes at christmaspast.media. You can check out their latest designs, which include one that's a roll of toilet paper developed this year in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Also, at christmaspast.media, you'll find lots of other Christmas fun like articles, quizzes, infographics, and more. I always love to hear from you, and I'm easy to get a hold of. You can drop a line anytime at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com or connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And join the private Christmas Past Facebook group if you haven't yet. And hey, if you're feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people discover this show? It's as easy as telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. If you do leave a review, I'll send you a Christmas Past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card as my way of saying thanks. Get in touch for details. And until we meet again, stay safe and healthy, look out for one another, and may your days be merry and bright.